Hey everyone, um, just a little screencast with a little more detail about um, current and resistance and the idea of resistance and also there are um, three equations on the AP formula sheet uh, that we haven't talked about. Um, I think only one of them w is likely to appear on, on the AP test in some form or another. The other two are really obscure but I uh, figured um, we better be thoroughly prepared since we don't have to worry about the magnet magnetism stuff on the test. I want to make sure we cover everything on there. So we've talked about current and resistance and we, we have Ohm's law, but um, Ohm's law is um, kind of takes an overall look at it, um, but it doesn't really talk about the materials. So, you know, we use copper wires when we wire stuff up. Your house has copper wiring in it, um, uh, but not all wires are exactly the same. So um, we have the idea of conductors and insulators, and we know that conductors allow current to flow. Insulators do not, okay? Um, but it's really not quite a binary thing. Um, so not all conductors are created equal. Some insulators are better than others, and there is a category of things sort of in between um, that we call semiconductors that are actually really important to the way we live, okay? Um, so just to, to bring in a little bit about that, um, it's pretty interesting. So superconductors are um, materials that allow current to go through with essentially no resistance at all. Okay, um, And this was discovered in the early 1900s um, when they were getting good at condensing gases down and, and getting things very cold. They used those gases to, to just test different materials and properties of them. And what they found is that mercury um, became a superconductor when it was very close to absolute zero here. Um, so this is on the Kelvin scale. So absolute zero is you know no motion of molecules, all that kind of stuff. So it's really, really, really cold. Okay, and you can see on this table here, it's kind of interesting. For decades, they discover different materials that are superconductors, and the temperature is going up a little higher. So ideally we'd love to be able to get a room temperature superconductor, something that at room temperature could conduct without resistance. Um, that would mean we'd have wires with no resistance at all. We could save a lot of energy that way um, and do some interesting things with that. So you can see for, you know, up until the 80s, um, we were all, um, the, the, the highest temperature superconductors were not, you know, the temperature was not rising very quickly. In the late 80s, early 90s, they started finding a whole new class of superconductors, um, and uh, the temperature started going up really quickly at which they would become superconductors. Um, so this raised a lot of hope that by this time, in the year 2020, some people would have said, you know, by now we would have had room temperature superconductors. It hasn't turned out that way, um, but I was surprised when I looked this up about how, how far it has risen in the last couple decades. So part of the thing is like uh, you need liquid helium to get down to these temperatures, excuse me, liquid hydrogen, which is really hard to make. It's pretty expensive. One of the big things about the high temperature superconductors is they superconduct and you can cool, get them down to those temperatures with liquid um, nitrogen, which is really pretty cheap. Um, so um, if you've ever seen demonstrations with liquid nitrogen, it's it basically, you know, a gallon of liquid nitrogen costs about the same as a gallon of milk if you have the right equipment. Um, you know, you can make it for relatively cheap. Um, and now it looks like in, uh, a group recently um, got over 200 Kelvin. So we're talking about, um, you know, negative 70 degrees Celsius, which is very cold. It doesn't approach room temperature, but you can see how far we've gotten with that. So those are interesting. Okay. Um, so you have the superconductors, which are, you know, some common substances. Some of them are fairly common. Certain elements, when they're extremely cold, um, our regular conductors, we have, you know, our regular old metals. Okay. Semiconductors are an interesting class of materials. Uh, so semiconductors, if you remember chemistry in your periodic table, um, you had that stair step separating the metals from the nonmetals. Um, and you said you had those, some people call those the metalloids, the thing 
And so the metalloids, remember, are near your stair step on your periodic table. Okay, so they are things um, like um, silicon and germanium and, and things like that. And the interesting thing about those is they are close to being conductors and under certain conditions they can made to be conduct and then other times they won't, which means they basically, we can make little switches out of them. So we can change them from conducting to non-conducting pretty easily with the application of a little voltage and all of a sudden we have switches that we can turn on and off and that is the basis of computers. Binary stuff is either on or off. Um, so with the semiconductors on a semiconductor material you can etch these little things in there like all these little switches and that's basically the whole idea behind computer chips um, so a huge part of our life these days is based on semiconductors and this ability that they we have to switch them on and off whenever we want um, that lets us do calculations and then we have the insulators of course so I just wanted to show that to you, um, especially if, if you have any interest in material science, you know, these, these um, superconducting materials are pretty interesting. Um, okay, so when it comes to the resistance of a wire, so we, we just said that we had resistors, you know, we just said it had a resistance of like 10 ohms. We didn't say how it got that resistance or, you know, or anything like that. Okay, but if you think about it, current is flowing through wires. Um, so if you have a, um, so let's say that this has a resistance R1 and we'll call this L1, this length here. So we're going to have current flowing through this wire. Okay. And we'll have current flowing through, we'll call that I1. And this is I2 and this will be L2. and we'll have resistance R2. So if you just think about it, it's not a superconductor, even if it's a metal, um, and there's, there's, it's not completely no resistance. There actually is some resistance. So the longer the wire is, um, the, the more resistance you have, okay? So that means that R2 would be greater than R1, okay? So the amount of resistance in a wire depends on how long the wire is. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. If you think about this, okay, um, same wire, same material, but now let's talk about the area here. So let's talk about A1, and then this has an area A2, so this cross-sectional area. So if we compare this R1 and R2, if you just think about it, is it easier for current to flow through a skinny little wire where it all has to cram through or a big fat wire where there's more room for it. Well, it's easier if there's more room for it. So that means that the resistance um, is inversely proportional to that area. So R1 or R2 would be less than R1. Okay. So greater area means it's easier for current to flow. Longer means that it is harder for current to flow. Okay. Um, now the last thing that has we have to deal with is the material itself. So you can make the wire out of all sorts of different materials. Okay. Um, and so there's a material property called the resistivity. Of the material. Okay. Um, so resistance is based on not only the material, but the, but the length and the cross-sectional area. So resistance is not like a material property. So different copper wires can have different resistances based on how thick they are and how long they are. So you can't say the resistance is a property just of copper. Resistivity, on the other hand, is a property just of the material itself. Okay. Um, and basically what we can see is that the greater the resistivity the harder it is for current to flow. Okay, um, so resistivity is symbolized um, by the Greek letter rho. Okay, so we ran into rho in terms of charge density, so they use it for more than one thing. It has units you can see here of ohms 
times meters. You can just see that on the chart here. So this chart just shows you when we're talking about a continuum. Okay, um, so these are some, some common metals. Um, you can see that silver is a slightly has a slightly lower resistivity than copper. That means silver is a slightly better conductor than copper. And you might be asking yourself, well, why don't we use silver wires instead of copper wires? Well, silver is more expensive, so we're willing to put up with that. Um, uh, so you can see here that not all metals are the same. So iron looks like it has, you know, four times the resistance of gold. Its resistivity is four times as much. Um, and it looks like a, maybe like about six times as much as copper. Um, so we wouldn't want to use iron wires or lead wires, okay? Um, so those are all near the, near the um, low resistance end, okay? We can see here um, this nichrome stuff. So sometimes, like in the, element, the heating element of an oven or a toaster, you want something that has some resistance to it because you want it to heat up when we pass current through it. So nichrome is a common material that they use for that. So you can see it's about a hundred times more resistivity than copper. Okay, so that makes it a good material to use for that. It still allows current to flow through, but it's not really easy. And so um, it's going to produce heat as it does that. Okay. Um, your germanium and silicon, those are your semiconductors. Okay, and then we get into the, so these would all be conductors. I'm not sure about the carbon. And that also depends on what form the carbon is in. Carbon has different things. I think graphene, that form of carbon, is actually a really good conductor. Uh, there are carbon nanotubes, there are all sorts of, there's diamond, there's all sorts of forms that carbon comes in. And I think that number actually depends on the, the form. And these are the conductors, so, or the insulators. So you can see that, you know, glass is a really good insulator, hard rubber, which we would use as like insulation on wires and so on. Um, is a good insulator. Um, fused quartz, I, I assume that would kind of be the extreme. Um, so the formula for resistance of wire is given by, uh, we're going to use capital R for resistance still. Okay, so it's going to equal the resistivity times the length over the area. So R is equal to resistance. going to be in ohms. L is equal to the length. Everything's got to be in SI units, so we're going to have our meters. Um, A is equal to the area. That's going to be a meter squared, so if you look at resistivity, So the units have to be, we want to end up with ohms, um, and we want to cancel out meters squared, but we already have meters there. So if you have ohms times meters, that's what you get. So if you think about it, um, if you think about wiring for your house, for example, um, so if you have some 15 amp circuits in your house, you're going to have wires that are fairly thick. Um, if you have an application where you have, need even more current than that, um, you want to have thicker wires, bigger A, so the resistance will go down. Okay, So you know the wires that you see on the poles out on the street are basically much thicker wires. Um, they tend to take wires and put them together, but A is going to go up and lower that resistance because you want to keep that resistance down. Um, you have to be careful, like if you have an extension cord, um, if you're going to use a device, like a, if you have like an electric lawnmower or something like that, um, that, that is, has a cord on it, um, it's probably going to be a pretty high current device, and so you want low resistance. So you may have to spring for a beefier um, 
a beefier extension cord so that you know that you can operate it without too much resistance and getting a fire hazard. Okay, so let me do a quick problem like this. I have to admit I just took this right out of the book. You could find it there. Um, so we've got this rectangular block. Made of iron. And so we've got 1.2 centimeters by 1.2 centimeters by 15 centimeters. Okay, and we want to calculate the resistance of the block. Okay, so we know the resistance is based on the resistivity, it's based on the length, and it's based on the area. Alright, so resistivity, we're just going to look that up in that chart. And since I don't want to go back, uh, I need to find the one in the book, sorry. So for iron, we've got 9.68 times 10 to the negative eighth. meters. Our length here is 15 centimeters, which is equal to 0.15 meters. And our area is 0.012 meters times 0.012 meters, or 0.012 squared. And so Insulting your intelligence by doing this. So we've got rho L over A. Pretty simple. So 9.68 times 10 to the negative 8th times 0.15 over 0.012 squared. And through the magic of looking in the book, um, Uh, we've got 6.5 times 10 to the negative 7th ohms, um, which you could also write as 0.65 micro ohms if you wanted. So and we expect, since it's a metal, it should have a pretty low resistance, um, but it's not actually zero. Okay. All right, the last thing I want to do is I want to show you these other two formulas that I, I can't imagine you'd have to use at all. Um, but they're on the formula sheet, so um, let's go over them just in case. Um, so one is basically if we take this formula, and this kind of is the definition of what resistivity really is, okay? So what we're going to do is if you imagine that there's going to be if you have a wire, if you have current flowing through there, remember if you have moving electric charges, they have to have something that makes them move. So they have to experience a force, and the electric field tells us what that force is. So we're going to have the electric field going through the... So we've got an E field going through there. Okay, and then J is what we call the current density. which is basically how much current we get per unit area. So if, some, if we have a large current density, that means it's, there's not a lot of resistance. So for a given electric field, we're getting a lot of current. If we have a really low current density, that means for that electric field, we're not going to get much charge flowing. Okay. Um, and so to make a long story short, if you really want to understand this, resistivity is equal to the electric field over the current density that you get. Okay, um, so if we get a lot of current for a given electric field, that means we have low resistivity, which would produce low resistance, I mean low resistance. Um, if we have not a lot of current, a small current density for a given electric field, then that means you have a high resistivity or a high resistance. So um, this is kind of the, the way I think to imagine it, but this is the formula given on the formula sheet. Okay, I honestly, unless you see the term current density, 
Um, and we know E is electric field. Like I said, unless you see the term current density, don't don't bother with this. Don't you know make things too hard. Um, I've I think I've seen maybe one question on an AP test that even brought that up in some remote way. Okay, this next one is probably even more obscure than that. Okay, this tells you how much current you're going to get based on some various properties. So N is equal to the number of charge carriers per unit volume. So what do we mean by that? Okay, so if you have a copper wire, you want to know how many electrons that are basically free to move, those conducting electrons, how many of those do I have per square meter or square centimeter or whatever? Um, so you can kind of imagine different materials would actually have different ones available. Um, you know, in a given chunk of the material, um, you might have fewer or more of these charge carriers, which are basically the free electrons if you're talking about metals. Okay. So E is the um, fundamental charge, or the charge of an electron. We don't worry about the sign on that. So that's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Okay, VD is equal to the drift velocity. That is, well, how fast are they going to go um, as they move through there? So we have the electrons, are they going to, they're not going to go at like an infinite speed. They can't do that. So they move along, and it's actually not all that fast, um, it turns out. So you have a lot of charge carriers, but they're not actually moving all that fast. Um, so that's the drift velocity, and A is again that cross sectional area. So I just wanted to tell you that those existed. So I feel like I've done my due diligence as, a, as an AP physics teacher. And um, the chances of you actually having to use them are pretty remote. Okay. So one of the things I will do is um, there is an AP problem that they suggested um, um, to do in the, in the new format. So we have this issue with the AP exam where traditionally you have three um, free response questions and they're all supposed to take about 15 minutes to do. Um, now we have a longer format question. So it's going to be a question that is you know, not exactly like anything that has been on an AP test before for the E&M test. Um, so there is actually an AP question from one of the past AP1 exams um, that is related to this topic and is the same format um, of this long, this longer format type of question. So I'm going to ask you to do that as an assignment. So you'll see that posted. All right, that's all I got. Thank you.